Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Grant. I serve as the coordinator of the Better Identity Coalition. I'm also a managing director in the cybersecurity and privacy practice at Venable. We're a law firm based out of Washington, D.C., uh, though I'm not a lawyer. There's a slightly longer story there for another time. Uh, really appreciate the invitation today to talk about building stronger digital identity for citizens. Uh, so about the Better Identity Coalition, uh, it's an organization whose focus is on developing and advancing consensus-driven cross-sector policy solutions that can lead to better tools for identity verification and authentication. Uh, we're an initiative of the Center for Cybersecurity Policy and Law, a nonprofit uh, devoted to promoting education and collaboration with policymakers on cybersecurity issues. Um, we were launched back in February 2018. Um, so in terms of how the coalition got started, uh, a lot of this really emerged somewhat by accident, I point out, uh, in the wake of the Equifax breach uh, in uh, late 2017 where there were a lot of policy questions uh, coming from people uh, in the U.S. Congress and the, uh, the White House and agencies around what do we actually do with the identity implications of this breach? Um, you know, we had a proposal at one point that we should replace the Social Security number with something new because more than you know, half of Americans had had their number compromised. Uh, we saw legislation introduced that would ban the credit bureaus from using the social security number for any purpose. You know, both of these were things that sounded really good in the wake of the headlines, but uh, from my perspective and a lot of others actually would have just exacerbated problems and made the situation worse. Uh, and so I was getting questions from, from, you know, different people in government on this topic, as well as it raised a broader issue of how do we actually do identity verification in a post-breach world, which as you can see on the right side of your screen led to a, a, a congressional uh, committee hearing in the House Committee on Energy and Commerce looking at this topic, if we're leveraging knowledge-based data uh, from the credit bureaus and other companies as the primary way to figure out who is who online, um, if these organizations are now getting breached, you know, what does the pathway look like going forward? So out of this, you know, more than a dozen companies from financial services, payments, healthcare, telecom, tech, some vendors as well, but largely driven by what I would call the big buyers of identity solutions came together to publish in the summer of 2018 Better Identity in America, a blueprint for policymakers that essentially laid out five core areas where government can and should help, um, and also had a specific action plan detailing who needs to do what in both Congress and the executive branch. Um, one of the things that was really clear in the blueprint is there isn't an easy answer here. There is no single action or initiative that can solve identity. Uh, nobody's doing anything like calling for a national ID card or you know, these brand new overarching systems. Um, that, you know, would be very heavy and sort of a, a top-down approach that candidly, I think most people think would fail here in the U.S. But the idea is that taken as a, pass, a package, if this policy blueprint's enacted and funded, it'll make identity better. And the blueprint contains five key initiatives. One, that the government needs to play a more active role in prioritizing the development of next generation remote ID proofing and verification systems, including actually playing a more direct role itself. Changing the way America uses the social security number, recognizing it's both an identifier, explaining, you know, which Jeremy Grant of the 300 or so that, you know, seem to be on Facebook or Google or me and which are somebody else. But it's also an authenticator. This idea that if I know the SSN, it somehow proves that I'm really me. Well, you know, that stopped being a reality a long time ago, unfortunately. Third with this is how do we promote and prioritize the use of strong authentication across the board? We know the SSN isn't a good authenticator. We know passwords are a mess as well. How do we get people towards more modern multi-factor authentication that can defeat identity-centric attacks? Uh, we talked about pursuing international coordination and harmonization, and finally, educating consumers and businesses about better identity. So I wanna focus a lot on, on this first one today um, in that I think a lot of what we're talking about when it comes to better, you know, call it citizen identity or consumer identity, the issues are really the same. You know, what are the things that need to be done? And in terms of framing the challenge, you know, it's worth noting, you know, we are recording this session in May of 2022. In about two months, in July, this cartoon that I think a lot of people who work around internet identity are, you know, familiar with, is going to be 29 years old, uh, which is really stunning for a bunch of reasons. Um, in that, you know, these dogs are, you know, sadly dead uh, because dog years, and their their children probably are as well. But the problem is with us more than ever today. In fact. As you look at things, the problem over the last 29 years has really gotten significantly worse. I was in college when this first came out, and, you know, it was a good cartoon that sort of captured what, you know, I think was maybe some of the, the mischief you'd run into online, but a lot of it was not necessarily focused on, you know, criminal efforts. It was much more, you know, amusing that you might not actually know who you were talking to. 
Whereas these days, dogs on the internet are actively being weaponized against us, and that it is a you know anomaly when a major breach or security incident happens online, and identity doesn't provide the attack vector. And you know, more recently, we've actually started to see, you know, different actors, you know, primarily hostile nation states like Russia, actually take advantage of, exploit how easy it is to be a dog on the internet to start interfering in democracies across the globe. But when we start talking about solving identity, it's not just about a security issue. We're also trying to figure out how to do it in a way that actually is preserving of privacy, that delivers good customer experiences, allows organizations to comply with all sorts of laws and regulations, uh, does this in a way that is actually able to lower transaction costs. So much of this really gets wrapped up in this concept of trust. How do we build identity systems that we can trust? And trust on the internet has very sadly over the last 29 years been hard to get right. But identity, when done right, helps to enable trust. Identity becomes the great enabler, providing the foundation for digital transactions and online experiences that are more secure, that are easier to use, and that can protect privacy better than the legacy solutions we have today. The challenge we've run into, uh, I used to uh, work at, at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. This is from the preamble my colleagues wrote to their digital identity guidelines in 2017. Why are we dealing with dogs on the internet after all these years? Well, digital identity presents a real technical challenge because the process often involves proofing individuals over an open network and always involves trying to authenticate that individual over an open network. And they went on to say that the processes and technologies that we use to establish and use digital identities offer a lot of opportunities for impersonation and other attacks. Our approach to date hasn't exactly been really sophisticated. So for those of you who might have you know, gotten a pandemic puppy over the last couple of years, uh, that name that you would, you know, pick for the dog, uh, you know, has taken on some some pretty serious consequences when it comes to the sorts of, you know, security uh, questions you'll be using the rest of your life. And of course, it's also been a challenge with security questions, and they're not always really practical. You might say, forget, um, you know, what your color is, or you know, one day it's green and the next day it's blue, and then you're thrown off into the gorge of eternal peril which is also known as the account recovery process that most organizations uh, use if you can't pass their security questions. And it's also been a real challenge when adversaries already know the answer. So, you know, questions like, what are the last four digits of your SSN? Those aren't a secret. I mean, the only logical answer to provide if you're asked that these days by your bank is, don't you realize that the Russians have that, the Chinese have that, about 87 well-organized criminal gangs have it, and any mediocre hacker can go find this on the dark web for 76 cents. It's just not a secret anymore. We need to stop building systems that presume knowledge of the SSN is somehow a secret. And of course, all of this just got a lot worse thanks to a global pandemic that, you know, for some time made it literally impossible to conduct any business uh, in person. Everything was shifted online. So, you know, one thing we've certainly seen here in the U.S., but I think it's been an issue across the globe, is, you know, a massive shift in exploiting stolen identity data, uh, largely by organized criminal gangs. These are some different headlines from a group called the Pandemic Accountability Relief Council, which is essentially in the U.S. government, a council of all the inspector generals who, you know, look into waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, massive issues on the identity front, particularly targeting uh, state unemployment programs where, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars were... Uh, allocated to the states from the federal government to deal with the massive spike in unemployment caused by the pandemic. And we basically saw a huge rush of organized crime then going into exploit weak or non-existent identity verification there. So on this front, the government said enough. Uh, this was a screenshot from a speech from Gene Sperling, who's the White House's uh, coordinator of the American Rescue Plan, all of the pandemic spending, where you know he pointed out if there was one thing that really came out this year, it was how this is a new and expanded theft, uh, threat of ID theft and fraud when it comes to public benefit programs. And I think what was really notable is he said, this isn't your father's identity fraud. This wasn't just individuals trying to do something on the side. It was largely criminal syndicates acting in an organized way, reusing stolen identities to defraud multiple relief programs in different states. And, you know, he flagged, if we don't do anything here, you know, the cost is going to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars in the next decade. And also he talked about this being a more systemic long-term problem, and that means having cross-government federal state solution. I'll say since this time, the Biden administration has said they will be issuing an identity theft executive order. Uh, we're you know, expecting that in the next few months. But I think what we saw a lot of this during the pandemic, it's not exactly a new problem. In fact, going back to the congressional hearing that I highlighted from 2017, uh, the chairman of the committee at the time, a, a congressman named Greg Walden, said, it was a really interesting point he made. He said, we 
we have gone through this cycle the last few years of a major breach happens and we sort of treat it in a vacuum and we look at all the things that happened and where the failures were and we'll have hearings and yell at people and shame them or whatnot. But he said, you know, when you start to look at all the breaches, really this, this epidemic of breaches that we've had over the last decade, any one of them on its own creates serious, serious policy issues. But we're now seeing is that malicious actors are able to combine multiple stolen data sets into one, which then enables them to obtain more complete packages of identity information that they can then use to go perpetrate the next breach. So the new realization, I talked about this before, is dogs in the internet are being weaponized against us. Uh, this was a screenshot of a op-ed in uh, Lawfare uh, that I co-wrote with Paul Rosenzweig about two years ago, uh, you know, pointing out that identity is where the attacks are coming and it's you know really time to actually do something about it. And I think there's a new realization happening here in the U.S. government right now, this you know, idea that identity infrastructure is critical infrastructure. In 2019, uh, CISA, uh, our Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency, published what they called 55 national critical functions, which were defined as um, functions of, of government in the private sector so vital to the country that you know, any disruption or dysfunction or disabling of them is going to have a debilitating effect on every sector of, of the country and both you know the, the government and the private sector. And one of the things that they flagged alongside things like process wastewater and make sure trains and planes are running, make sure communications networks and electricity networks are running, is providing identity management and associated trust support services. So it's been really good to see a, a recognition of where we actually have issues here. So I've talked a lot about the problem, but I think a big question is, why has this been so hard to solve? And one of the things we talk about in our policy blueprint is that there's an identity gap here in the US, and I think in other countries across the globe as well. But certainly, uh, you know, it's an issue that's quite acute here in the US, where, you know, okay, we don't have a national ID, but we have a number of nationally recognized authoritative identity systems. I've got a driver's license, a social security card, a passport, a global entry card. All of them are trapped in the paper world. And we're all trying to do things more and more online. And, you know, over the last 29 years, while we've been struggling with dogs on the internet, there's never been an effort to try and close this gap between physical credentials and the digital environments that we're all trying to actually transact in today. So, you know, if you've ever had knowledge-based, you know, authentication, knowledge-based verification questions uh, asked of you, say, if you're trying to open a, a new, you know, credit account or prove who you are to a government agency, well, this was an attempt to get around the identity gap. And, you know, maybe they weren't the greatest tools that were out there, but this was an example of industry saying, look, we need a tool to enable trusted digital commerce and figure out who's who. And, you know, knowledge-based verification, uh, despite its flaws, was the best solution out there in the market for a while. And look, it worked for a while, but what we're seeing today is attackers have caught up. This idea of knowledge-based questions based on things that would be out-of-wallet questions, meaning if I stole your wallet or found it on the street, I couldn't go through it and answer the questions. They're not as secret as they used to be. And in fact, two years before the Equifax breach, uh, the Internal Revenue Service and the Treasury Department uh, was dealing with a massive breach where more than, I think at the end of the day, it was more than 700,000 Americans lost you know, all of their tax information to hackers. Because as you can see, you know, circled uh, in the, the, the bottom of the page, hackers already had the keys. They had the answers to these questions. They were able to basically slice right through these, these knowledge-based systems uh, to impersonate people and then get in and convince the IRS that you know they weren't a dog on the internet, they were a real person, but in fact, they were criminals. NIST has you know, been pretty clear on this um, in their you know, Q&A on their most recent digital identity guidelines. They point out knowledge-based verification can't be used to, to satisfy verification requirements anymore at higher levels of identity assurance, you know, recognizing the fact that the attackers have caught up. So I'd say in summary, where we are today, we're at a point where our transactions are increasingly digital, but our authoritative identity systems just haven't caught up. Everything's stuck in the paper world. Solutions like knowledge-based verification that papered over that helped for a while, but the attackers have caught up. Any shared secret, be it a social security number, be it a password, it's not secret anymore. Industry innovation is doing a lot of good things in this space. I'm seeing a lot of you know, next generation identity solutions were you know, on the verge of passwordless authentication, particularly in the wake of uh, the big announcement uh, this past month uh, from the FIDO Alliance and the work that Apple and Google and Microsoft are all doing to collaborate to make passwordless a default. I'm seeing some really interesting artificial intelligence enabled identity proofing tools that are performing a lot better than legacy solutions. 
you know, there's a lot of innovation here that's actually doing great things uh, to solve problems in this space. But so much of this ignores the issue that government is the only authoritative issuer of identity. And so in this next phase of making identity better, as our coalition would, you know, suggest, the government's going to have to play some sort of a role. So when we talk about addressing this issue of, you know, remote identity proofing and verification systems, a lot of what we laid out in our policy blueprint is, you know, a pretty simple concept, which is if I've already gone through the process of having an agency vet my identity once, perhaps to get a driver's license or passport, and I get this physical credential, if I'm trying to do something online, can I then ask that agency to vouch for me when I need to prove who I am to another party? And so at the core of our blueprint is the idea that our legacy paper-based systems ought to be modernized around a privacy-protecting, consumer-centric model that would basically allow any consumer to ask an agency that issued them the credential to stand behind it in the online world by validating the information from that credential. Um, it's not a radically new idea. In fact, back in 2016, there was a bipartisan commission on enhancing national cybersecurity that was established to make recommendations. Uh, one of the things that they stuck on uh, or you know, really emphasized was, you know, why don't we actually have a concerted effort in this country to address these challenges in the public and private sector so that compromises of identity can be eliminated as a major attack vector by 2021? Well, it's 2022 now, clearly this didn't happen. But one of the things that they specifically emphasized in the report uh, was suggesting that agencies needed to find a way that they could start validating identity attributes in the broader identity market. And you know, I won't read the full, you know, three paragraphs on the right side of the screen, but you know, you can see what this language was. People have been kicking this idea around for a while, but it's been slow to actually take effect. I will say we're making some early progress here in the U.S. Uh, with the Social Security Administration launching uh, ECBSV. It's uh, the Electronic Consent-Based Social Security Number Verification System. Uh, it was launched in June of 2020. Uh, in response to uh, a regulatory reform bill in the banking sector that was passed two years earlier. And it, does a, it sounds like a really simple thing. If you know, I am applying to a bank and you know, they or the, the service provider they're working with you know, to validate identity hasn't seen me before, they're not really sure if I'm real or not, it'll give a simple yes, no answer that there really is a Jeremy Grant with you know, my social security number and date of birth who's not dead. Just that yes, no answer though can help you know, reduce what the Federal Reserve here in the U.S. has estimated is a $20 billion a year problem with synthetic identity fraud, where you'll see somebody take a social security number that nobody's ever used before in the banking system, perhaps belonging to a child, and then put some other fake information with it to trick the banks and the credit bureaus into thinking that somebody's real. And so it's you know really a bit of a game changer just to be able to get this yes, no answer and that you get this very strong signal from the government Yes, there's a match. And that addresses, you know, synthetic identity fraud has been, uh, according to a lot of banking regulators, the fastest growing type of financial crime here in the U.S. the last few years. Um, this is, you know, good progress. Although I should flag, it's only available to banks, the way the law is crafted. And we're actually having this interesting discussions in the U.S. around why can we also use this if somebody's applying for government services? And that there's also a synthetic identity fraud problem uh, when it comes to, to benefits fraud. I think another thing we're excited about is uh, bipartisan congressional legislation uh, in the House of Representatives, H.R. 4258, uh, the Improving Digital Identity Act of 2021. Uh, it was introduced by uh, Congressman Bill Foster, a Democrat from Illinois, who's really active on, on fintech and cryptocurrency issues, uh, along with John Katko, who is the ranking Republican on the House Homeland Security Committee, heavily focused on cybersecurity issues, and also supported by another Democrat, uh, Jim Langevin, uh, the co-chair of the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus, uh, and Barry Laudermilk, who uh, works with Mr. Foster on the Financial Services Committee around fintech and AI issues. Um, so, you know, great bipartisan uh, bill to have out there. We're expecting the Senate counterpart, uh, hopefully to be introduced soon, having some good discussions on that side. Um, the bill has a really novel approach from our perspective in that it has three pillars to better identity. Um, the first thing we would do was it really recognizes that in the U.S. you need to take a whole of government approach in that while government might be the only authoritative issuer of identity, that role is actually split between the federal, state and local level. So, you know, my birth certificate was issued by the county I was born in, uh, in Michigan. Uh, my, you know, state's given me my driver's license. The federal government has given me a social security number and a passport. All of those are right nationally recognized and authoritative. I can take the physical versions of those any place and have them accepted if we're going to try and move into the digital space, 
this can't just be a federal government effort or just a state effort. We really need the whole of government effort. And so it calls on the White House to essentially convene all of those different stakeholders in the space and come up with that whole of government effort. Uh, second, in part because you know standards are important and in part because there's a lot of ways government could play a role here that would be uh, kind of scary or creepy from a security or privacy perspective. It points to the team at NIST to say, look, before agencies implement these tools, we ought to have a framework of standards along with policies and rules and best practices that any agency at any level of government can use to create interoperable services that set a high bar for security and privacy. And I think a benefit beyond the security and privacy side is if everybody's focusing on the same standards, then the economic benefits of digital identity can be much uh, more easily realized across the country. And that you know, I'm a bank or a health insurer who's doing business in all 50 states, I want to have some consistent interfaces, some consistent architectures that I'm able to lean on and not have one state with one approach and one with a completely other one. It's going to be much more difficult to get uh, the benefits uh, there and really deploy identity in a way uh, that's truly efficient. And then also recognizing that a lot of this might, you know, really rely on infrastructure investments, uh, would authorize grant dollars to the states to modernize their legacy ID systems to support digital ID. So we're really excited in the coalition about this bill. We think it's, you know, the right approach to go forward and, you know, we're cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to make progress on it in uh, the months ahead. And, you know, I think a, a final point on this, and I, you know, touched on this a little bit before, while we're really focused on the role that government needs to play in identity verification, government can't solve the challenges alone. Industry will need to continue to play a role, uh, augmenting any government components like attribute validation services with what I would call more holistic identity security solutions that complement those components. Um, you know, among other things, you know, we don't wanna be just taking a rules-based approach based on static data sitting in a database somewhere but you know, we really need, I think, from modern identity security to be deploying more modern adaptive approaches that will look at a variety of data elements to give people a broader view of holistic, uh, broader ho or holistic picture of identity and fraud risk. And I think also in the near term, because while I'm really optimistic on a lot of the things that you know are in these three pillars, um, without a concrete change in how government approaches digital identity, we're going to be you know using a lot of industry solutions uh, in the near term to stop identity centric attacks. Uh, and, you know, there there's, you know, like I said before, a lot of innovation and some good work underway. I think the end state of this is a hybrid approach where government provides those elements that they are best suited to over time. And perhaps only they can provide augmented with industry solutions. Uh, so with that, I'm not sure given the format of this event, we'll have time to, to tackle additional questions in the chat. Uh, but here's my information. And thank you all for uh, taking the time uh, to view this today. Thank you.